today we have a conversation with my friend Jenny where we talk about some of the heart and the mission and the vision behind the She Hears Bible Study and the podcast. And we talk a little bit about stress and soul care and how all of that is tied together with our relationships, our minds, our bodies, our spirits, and how if any one of those things are off, we just don't feel like ourselves. So stay tuned. I think you're going to really be blessed by this episode. Lots of behind the scenes content where you just get to know me and my heart a little bit. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. I know sometimes you doubt if you are truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own. I know that you are praying for a way to know the difference and to be confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word. If you are ready to grow in your faith and your identity in Christ and to confidently step into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org. And for a limited time, I'm offering all of my podcast listeners a special discount of 20% off. You can use the discount code hearing Jesus. That's one word, all caps, to get your discount. There are also some free videos and a leader's guide for you to get started. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Rachel, I'm so glad that we got to talk together today because I know that our ministries overlap a lot and I think our audiences may even overlap quite a bit. Can you share a little bit about what what led you into ministry and what led you to care about women and their relationships with God? Yeah, of course. And and thank you so much for having me. I think that, like you said, we have a lot of overlap in our audiences and we serve the same uh, mission and vision a lot. So yeah, I have been in ministry both locally and globally for about the last 10 years. And I started off with children's ministry actually. And I owned a daycare for a long time and did a Christian preschool and really felt the Lord starting to call me out of that. And it was a huge leap of faith and I transitioned into a full-time ministry role. And in that role, I served as the children's pastor. However, when you are a children's pastor, you are really ministering to the whole family, not just the child. And so through that process, I really had a heart for moms because there's just this level of trust when, when a mom is Uh, giving over their child to you for an hour every single week and you see them consistently, you end up developing relationships. And then often you become the first one to know about, you know, troubled marriages or issues with the kids. And so what I found myself in was just really a season of ministering to, to young moms. And that also was replicated across the globe as I was traveling. I work in five different countries. And so I would see a lot of the same issues, regardless of the culture, regardless of the location, the same heart issues were were there. And so what happened for me is my primary calling has always been evangelism and discipleship, but that kind of shifted from the children more to the moms and not just moms, women in general. But what I started to see was that God was giving me a unique opportunity to speak into the hearts and the lives of women just all over. And the benefit of that is he was starting to redeem some of my own brokenness through that process. And so I started really just listening for whatever God wanted me 
to do. And what that resulted in is him just opening up doors to really just uh, speak into that heart space of women, you know, both here and across the globe. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting because, <laughs> because actually um, I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor. And when I was in college, I wasn't sure that that's really what I wanted to do, but I love psychology and I love caring for people. And I kind of interned as um, an elementary school counselor thinking that's really what I wanted to do. But then I ended up doing an internship later at an agency and I saw adult women and I never even really turned back. I mean, I've seen some adolescents, I've seen some marriage and families, but in general, like women is where the Lord has me. And granted, I have four boys. So maybe he was protecting me knowing that I, my life would be full of children later, but, um, but the Lord led me to women in a, in a different way, but kind of, kind of similarly, kind of through a back door sort of, yeah, it's um, interesting. when you say you work in five countries and I know you're a missionary, what does that entail? How did you get to five countries? Well, I had been working in the local church with a heavy, heavily mission focus uh, calling. And so we were already working in three different countries. I spent a lot of time in, in um, a couple African countries. And then prior to the pandemic, the Lord started really preparing my heart for transition. And I knew that, but I didn't really know what that meant. I just knew I, I had been through enough transitions in my life that I could just kind of feel it spiritually. I knew something was going on. The Lord was starting to prepare my heart. And at the same time, I had written my first book was called Go. It was all about starting an outreach uh, ministry. And the founders of Children of the Nations were in their search looking for a new spiritual care director. And somebody on the hiring team got a hold of my book and they said, we need to get this girl on our team. And so I transitioned to that role as hard as it was because I have such a heart for our local community, but I transitioned to the role with Children of the Nations. And primarily my role is to oversee the spiritual care department. And so with each of our five countries, we have campuses in each of those countries. And then I have a counterpart, a spiritual care counterpart. So essentially I'm pastoring the pastors in those countries. And wow, yeah, that's been um, incredible because obviously I have three kids. We're pretty grounded here in Pennsylvania and I have such a heart for missions and I just didn't know how that was going to work. And yet the Lord opened up a door for me to, to be able to do that. And the travel schedule is really dependent on whatever works for me. And of course, right now we're not traveling. So it's a lot of Zoom calls and WhatsApp calls and, and those kinds of things. But the goal is to eventually, once travel opens back up, to start getting back into some of those countries. Wow, that's amazing. What an adventure. Yeah, it's exciting. And, you know, for my kids, even we've, we've done missions trips, um, since they were little with them, we, the, the kids have already been exposed to just living missionally. And so that was a big thing too. Like we really wanted to give them a biblical worldview that was bigger than our local context. And, you know, I, I was probably mid twenties before I had seen poverty. I mean, real poverty, third world country poverty up close. And it changed me. It changed my worldview. It changed everything thing about how I minister, how I serve, how I parent. And I thought, man, even with my first trip, I thought, man, when I want my kids to be exposed to this before they go to college. And so we started local outreach ministry to some of the local housing, um, agencies around town. And we ended up um, just developing a program that really reached out to the lost and the hurting and the broken in our own community. And then the neat thing about that is God ended up replicating that. And we started leading churches and ministries all across the globe and training them how to do the same thing. And so we have just been a missional family since the kids were really little. And so this kind of felt like the natural next step to transitioning into um, just a larger missions role. Yeah. Okay. I know that you just released a Bible study, which is a really big deal and not something that most people ever do in their lives called She Hears. And on your podcast, you've been kind of going through that over the last few weeks. Um, but can you talk a little bit like from, for my listeners about what led you to write that Bible study and, and what it's about? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there was really two aspects to what led to the Bible study. And I had written my first book. And after that, my editor and publisher, they were always kind of listening for ideas I had, and they really wanted me to write another book. And I had the opportunity to teach on the Samaritan woman locally. 
And as I was sharing her message, a, a couple of friends came to me and said, this message is bigger than just our church. Like you really need to start sharing this, you know, in a larger platform. And so there was two driving forces kind of at work at the same time. On one hand, the book is called She Hears, and it's all about learning to listen to Jesus. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but for me as a woman in ministry, um, sometimes my voice would be disregarded depending on who else was in the room. And, you know, there were situations where I could be saying the same thing as somebody else, but if it was a male counterpart, their voice would be heard where mine was kind of shushed. And that was happening, not just um, locally, but even, you know, I was speaking at children's pastors conferences and working with other churches. And my husband who had had less experience than I did and really was just there to accompany me, they would take him more seriously than they would take me. And not everywhere, but that that did happen. And I thought, man, I, I don't understand why this is happening. And here, what I started to hear from other women that were in ministry or even just lay leaders, they were feeling like their voice just didn't matter. And they would be in uh, different, you know, there's different theological circles that believe different things about that. But regardless of that, there was just this huge insecurity that also was coupled with this sense of how, how can I know that God is really speaking to me? How can I tell the difference between my own emotions and my own thoughts and whether or not it's God? And so I started to hear kind of both of those echoed, not I mean, really in other countries too. It was really just a consistent thing that I started to pay attention to because it was, you know, something I was struggling with myself. And I had taken it to the Lord in prayer, was really just concerned about how, how do I approach this? How do I deal with this? And this is a bigger problem than just me. And because I have a heart for other leaders, other women, I wanted to be able to minister to them in a way that was effective, but obviously that had to start with me. And I was in a moment of worship, and I remember very clearly I was in the back of the room, and I was just kind of pouring my heart to, out to the Lord, praying through it. And as clear as day, the Holy Spirit um, very clearly said to me, Rachel, you do hear me. And it was so um, impactful for me because, number one, he was speaking to me, and I could very clearly, you know, as, as clear as I knew that I was supposed to marry my husband, I knew that God was speaking to me. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that happened. And then I started praying through how, how do I make this a reality? Because I don't want to just know this because God spoke it, but I want to know this from scripture because the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. So I started on a personal Bible study of just looking at the women in the life of Jesus. And I'm a firm believer that we have to look at everything through the lens of Jesus. And so when we read that whole meta narrative of scripture, we have to do it in with the lens of who Jesus is, what he says, and how he interacts with people. And so I just started looking at different women in the life of Christ. And I started, of course, with the Samaritan woman because she was just the, the foundational you know, message that God had given me. And then it expanded to the six women that we see in the book. And the thing that was really important for me was to give women a tool that extended past the pages of the book. So then when they finished that six weeks, they would have a skill set that would help them dig into the scriptures for themselves and really be able to understand when God was speaking to them and how the pages of scripture, or the lessons we learn are relevant to their lives today. Yeah. Well, that's quite a journey. There haven't been a ton of times that I've heard the Lord almost audibly, but when it does happen, it like resonates all through you, doesn't it? <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I knew it was bigger than just me. Like I, I mm -hmm. it was, it was almost a calling in the sense of I had been, again, my heart had started to really be prepared for just this angst that not just I was feeling, but other women in the body of Christ were feeling. And then when, when God kind of shared that with me, I thought, okay, well, this is the solution. I, I need to get in and dig in on my own so I can teach this. And so really what happened at that point is I presented it to my publisher. And at the time they were kind of going through a transition. They weren't really publishing a whole lot. And they said, that, you know, they kind of just sat on it. And then I continued to study and kind of develop it for my own personal Bible study. And then when the pandemic hit, we had gone through the whole Me Too movement at that point, and this message just be, suddenly became much more relevant. So they actually reached out and said, hey, how soon can you write this book? And I said, well, 
I can work on it. So, <laughs> you know, thankfully I didn't stop. I kept working on it. So then at, during the pandemic, I just kind of formatted it for actual Bible study um, for other people and engaging in some of the content through, you know, meditation and looking up extra scripture and just formulating it so other people could kind of glean the things that the Lord had been teaching me to. Yeah. Well, we were talking a few minutes ago before the before we actually started recording about um, our heart for women and like how the pandemic has affected people mental health wise and how attention spans are a lot shorter right now because, you know, we're used to scrolling all day and TikTok and everything um, and how it's really difficult to hear to hear God. And as a counselor, I mean, way before the pandemic, probably. I mean, I see people that are not just Christians, but I do see a lot of people of faith. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that comes up really frequently among people who are depressed and anxious is they will say things like, um, I used to hear God, but I just don't hear him anymore. Or I can open the pages of scripture, but it feels dry. Like I can't concentrate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a common thing that maybe it feels isolating. Like if I'm not hearing God, there must be something wrong with me. And I, and I always want to remind people that if you've been through trauma, if you've been through anxiety, if you've got depression, that our brains begin functioning differently. It doesn't mean God's gone away, but it does bring down our attention spans because we just don't have the bandwidth mm -hmm. to think deeply and to be still and present and open in the same way that we normally are, but that he's still there. And so I know that there's a big need for that right now, specifically out in the world is like getting, getting still, being able to heal, being able to be present and feel the Lord and get in his word and know his truth for ourselves. And it, and people might need a little encouragement right now because that feels harder than usual. I don't know if you're noticing that or if you've heard any of that in your ministry. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think that's twofold. I think right now, especially people are feeling that. Um, but I think always there is this, you know, what I hear a lot is I can read a passage of scripture and I check off my box at the end of the day because I, uh -huh. read, I read it, but it doesn't make any sense to me. There's too many words on the page or I don't understand what it says, but yet I keep through through my reading plan because I don't want to disappoint God. So I just keep pushing through. And my philosophy on that is I would rather you spend the whole week on, on, 10 verses and those become relevant and applicable and you understand them and they are, you know, you're meditating on them and they make a difference for you than you to read 10 chapters that week. Because, you know, I think one of the, the fallacies is, is that con like the amount of content that we're reading is what counts. And really, I think it's quality. And I, and I honestly, I think that is, replicated in our real life relationships. You know, if I'm sitting in the same room with my daughter who's watching TV or she's scrolling TikTok all day long, that is not the same thing as having a, an engaging conversation where she's sharing her heart and I'm sharing mine. And so I try to remind people that our relationship with the Lord is very much like our relationship with people. And, you know, one of the things that we do in the book is we stay on the same passage of scripture for five days. And then we engage with it in different ways. And so we might be looking for who who this passage of scripture is talking about. Is it talking about God? Is it talking about Jesus? Is it Mary? Who is it? And then we kind of go through different aspects where I'm teaching women to look intentionally for things within the word. And then what happens by the end of the week is you have had five days of reading the same passage over and over to the point where you're starting to see things you might not have seen before. And when we read quickly, it just doesn't sink in. So I really encourage women, um, well, everybody, to to spend more time on a specific passage and not to rush through it. Um, and then I also think that worship it plays a huge part in that. And that's one of the things I say over and over in the study. We do a playlist with the study where um, I have like a guided playlist of different worship songs to focus on throughout the week. And one of the things I really encourage people to do is at the end of that five days, whether it's Saturday or you're catching up, whenever it is, to spend some time in worship over the things that, that God might be putting, um, you know, bringing to mind or bringing to surface. Because one of the things I think from a mental health perspective, 
the, as I was reading through and learning from these women of scripture, the, there was things that were rising to the surface that the Lord needed to heal in me. And mm-hmm. I think worship is one of the ways that we can just get on our knees before the Lord and offer those things up and say, okay, Lord, like this is a mess in my life and I need your intervention because really apart from you, I can do nothing. And I, I feel like one of the primary messages I've been sharing with people is that's the reality. The reality is apart from him, we can do nothing. And so thinking that we can come out of this pandemic or come out of isolation or job loss or whatever it is and just muscle through it, that's the enemy's tool to keep us isolated away from, from God. And so I think what I've been pushing people to is get getting back on their knees and realizing who we are apart from Christ is not going to function well um, as far as repairing the damage that's been done. I agree with that 100%. That's so good. Yeah, and another aspect, I think, of healing is community because people have been so isolated. And I heard it recently said, um, I can't remember where, but it makes a lot of sense that um, as American Christians who are literate, we spend a lot of time in individual Bible study. But originally, people couldn't read. (laughs) So, So you read together and you memorized together and it was more of an oral tradition. And so that wouldn't have been done by yourself. That would have been done with others. And coming out of a pandemic where people have been really separated, I think we've missed a lot of the community aspect that comes with what church should be, you know, which is coming together, learning, growing, praying together. Um, Yeah. And I think your Bible study is beautiful because you can do it by yourself. Or you can do it in community and you even have an online community where people can come and listen to your podcast and interact Um, and you have a blog. And so there's an online community for that too, which is awesome. Yeah. And one of the things we're going to be doing this fall is an online Bible study where it's going to be a guided Bible study through the book, but it's going to hopefully engage that online space for community even further. And uh, we're going to, you know, go through some interaction and, and really kind of pick apart the way that God is using it to speak to, to individuals. We did that with our launch team and it was so valuable and it taught me even things, um, the perspectives that the women had on the things that God was teaching them. So we're going to be doing that this fall, I think probably maybe October. But the other thing too, is we are getting ready to put out a leader guide that will be free for download on the publisher's website so that if people do want to do it together in community, there's a leader guide that goes through um, discussion questions and just some leadership tips. And uh, it, there's videos that I put up on my website that kind of goes along with that. So people can have some extra free resources because that's really my heart. My heart is really to help walk people back to Christ or further deeper in the relationship with Christ. And like you said, I think uh, community is the space that, that, that happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a curiosity question for you. You had um, six women that you looked at in the Bible. Was there one specific one that really stood out to you in any way or that you really connected with? Well, prior to writing the book, um, I had done a lot of research and study on the Samaritan woman uh, in seminary, and you know she had had a story that really resonated with me. However, that I feel like really represented brokenness in my past. And so mm-hmm. when I was writing the study, um, the one that resonated the most with me in my recent you know, life was the story of Mary, uh, I'm sorry, Martha, the sisters, Mary and Martha, um, because I definitely have been a Martha. And I think anybody that's a mom or in ministry or, you know, working outside of the home uh, or even inside the home, moms have a tendency to become Martha's because there's just a lot of stuff to get done. And I just remember having all of these internal thoughts of like, why isn't anybody helping me? Or don't they see all the uh-huh. stuff that needs to get done? And I would love to just sit at the feet of Jesus, but I got to cook dinner. You know, those were all thoughts that were very, uh, very familiar to me. And the brazen attitude, I, one of the things I love about the relationship between Martha and Jesus is she is very brazen with him, which I think is an indicator of the closeness of their relationship. Like she really did have a close f- familial type relationship with him. And so when she kind of gives it to him, I thought, you know, I need to be okay with taking my negative emotions to to the Lord. Of course, you know, in worship, praise you, Lord. And, you know, those are things that were familiar. But I had a tendency 
to not be honest with the Lord about the things that I was mad about or the things that I felt were unjust. I would just bottle those up and just deal with them on my own or deal with them in unhealthy ways. And it was actually during the season, I had already written the book, but I was going back to write the leader's guide, which was actually a little bit harder. Um, I had not done leader's guides before. And so I had to revisit that content again and just say, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to get out of this? And he really was starting to speak to me about how how, um, you know, the relationship I had had with him was based on what I was doing instead of who he is and really Mm -hmm. pushing. He really pushed me towards realizing, you know, especially after coming out of a busy season of ministry, like a decade of busy ministry to just being at home. Um, that was quite a change for me. And I felt so restless because I was used to being on the street and go, go, go and constantly having all these projects going. And finally, you know, I had to sit down and really just listen for what God was saying to me. And through that process, you know, one of the things I say in the book is if you never never do anything ever again, He's still going to love you. And of course, you know, God has a role for all of us to play in the kingdom. And I'm a a big component, component of serving and all of that. But when our identity becomes wrapped up in what we're doing instead of who Christ says we are, there, there's um, a disconnect there and it can lead us to a, a really unhealthy place. So I think out of all of the women, Martha was the one that I really, um, it was the hardest for me to write and it was also the hardest for me to revisit, but it's probably been the biggest lesson that I learned. I'm so glad that you brought Martha up (laughs) because I probably would agree with that. And I've been thinking about her a little bit lately because um, a few years ago, my mom came to visit and my house is just a mess. I mean, I've got four kids. I'm working part time. I'm trying to do this. I don't know why I take on as much as I do, but I volunteer for things and I'm miss social. So I'm going out to play dates and stuff, you know, and housework is just not my favorite. It's just not. But when I have somebody coming over or when it's piled up for a little bit, then I go into like ultra mom mode where I'm like scrubbing, cleaning, kind of freaking out, like boys, pick up your stuff, you know, especially when somebody's about to come over. Anyway, my mom was here a few years ago and she said, well, Jenny, you're not the best house cleaner, but you know, I just really think it's because you have a heart for people. I think you're, I think you're just a Mary. And I actually took that as a compliment, but at the same time, I was like, I don't, I don't know though. I think she's just given me a nice excuse for having done that. (laughs) But I do think that's where my heart is. I think my heart is that I want to sit with people. Like I want to sit with Jesus, but when I get stressed, I go into Martha mode, which is okay. I've got to, pre- I've got to prepare all these things. I've got to do all these things. Like I only have until six o'clock people are coming over or I have to be su- at such and such a place and I've got to get dinner ready. And then when I'm in that stressful mode, it's like I switch. It's like I switch over like a, and I, and I think that's what stress does to us a lot yeah. as women is we, we could be like Mary, but when we're in stress mode, we look a lot more like Martha. Yeah. So I've been thinking about that this summer. Like how can I marry the two where I can get all of the things done I need to get done and not be in a frenzy doing it or not be complaining and resentful that other people aren't helping me, but I can still be present to hear what the Lord is telling me and to have a heart that can listen, even when I'm scrubbing the toilet, you know, instead of being in a frenzy like Martha was and complaining about it. Um, And so I was telling you before the podcast uh, this season, my, my podcast is going to look a little bit different. Um, I still am going to do some guest interviews, but I'm going to have a lot more short meditative reflective episodes that go into scripture that help us to, slow down, slow our bodies down, slow our minds down. Because I think when we can do that, we're much more prepared to sit like Mary and be, and be able to hear what the Lord has to say and to have receptive hearts to do that. At least in my life, that seems to be the case (laughs) when I'm not quite so busy and frenzied or inside of myself and outside of myself in my schedule, then it's easier for me to sit like Mary and be prepared to hear what the Lord has to say and to be more receptive. Yeah, for sure. And you know, the, the two, it's hard to separate the two. Um, and, and I actually go into more of the story of Lazarus in looking at the difference between the two, but we do touch on it because it's hard hard to separate the two. But one of the things that hit me was, you know, in that culture, 
preparing and serving the host, like as the host, preparing and serving serving the rabbi, when you had a guest like that, that was part of the religious culture. So, right. you know, she felt like she was doing what God expected of her. And that just so resonated with me because I was busy doing all good things. It was all ministry related. It was all serving people. And, you know, I have heart for people too. So, you know, not cleaning my house so I can go out and do sidewalk Sunday school, you know, in one of the housing complexes was a very common thing for me, Um, (laughs) you know, and so I, it was, it was the moment when, you know, what Jesus says to her, he said, you know, Mary's doing, um, this is, this is the best thing. And the good thing, the good part. And I thought, man, how many times do I exchange um, what I think is good for what God thinks is good? Mm-hmm. And just even that sense of maybe the house will go clean, maybe it won't, um, but my heart will be full because I've been obedient to what God has called me to do. And what I have found is just like with the tithing principle, when, when we give God our time, um, we're able to do more with our time than if we hadn't, you know, carved out that time for him. And so yeah. that has had to been, I mean, that's been a discipline I've had to learn where, um, you know, and I'm also a studier, so I don't want to just take out my Bible and read one passage. I want to study it and I want to dig deep and I want to look at the Greek and the Hebrew and all of that. And I think, well, if I don't have an hour, I don't want to do anything, which it was just, you know, the end me trying to keep me out of God's word. And so I have reserved certain days for deep intentional study like that. And then I've given myself the grace to just be present in God's word and listen for his voice. Even if I'm reading the same one over and over for the whole week, that's okay because it's making, um, it's making it more relevant and helping me to understand it more clearly. But then I find then I don't have as much stress when it comes time to doing all the other things that I need to do. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. Me too, for sure. Okay, Rachel, is it okay if I switch topics for a second? Sure, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I was listening to your podcast and I heard you say that you're an Enneagram 8. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the Enneagram and I don't talk about it on every podcast, but I I love it. I love it as a tool to see people in a different way, to have compassion for people. I think it's great for self-understanding and knowing ourselves, not just when we're in a good place, but when we're in a place, I mean, a normal place, but like if we're in a stress place or if we're in a growing season, what that looks like, I think it can be invaluable. So I wonder for you as a woman in leadership and an Enneagram 8, how do you see that come into play or does it Oh, it definitely does. <laughs> um, and my, actually, our team, um, we have done a lot of work on the Enneagram to help us understand each other. And we have a lot of eights and ones on our team. And Interesting. Yeah, it is. And and I think the reason for that is we have a tendency to be justice warriors for both eights and ones. And yeah. so um, it's interesting. I think Martha was an eight, actually. But I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think for me... One of the things that drives me is that that eight drive to be a, a world changer. Um, that's for sure part of the reason why I, you know, always have things going because I always feel driven to to do more, be more, say more, do more things. Um, but that being said, like we see with with Martha, um, it, that can drive you to a really unhealthy place and. When I'm unhealthy, I go to like my five cave and we were actually talking about this with some of our other staff and one of uh, my counterparts, um, our worship pastor, he said, well, he said, we know when you're stressed because you go in your office and you shut the door and you don't come out. And he said, and when you're not stressed, you're up in our face talking the whole day. And it was so indicative (laughs) of my behavior patterns. Like they've worked with me for seven, 10 years, some of them. And so, you know, we have gotten to a place where we can kind of read each other and the Enneagram has been so helpful for that. But I think we need on our teams, we need a lot of the numbers because we all operate with different functions and different gifts and different strengths. But I think one of the things that's been really helpful is recognizing those stress points. And so when I withdraw from people, normally I'm a people person, I'm in your face all the time. But I mean, even my kids are like, okay, mom, like I need a minute, you know, my, my introvert children. But, um, 
I can recognize my behavior when I feel like I need to withdraw. I know that there's something amiss. So whether it's, you know, I haven't spent enough time with the Lord or there's been stressful things going on inside or outside the home, it's helpful for me now because before I used to just, I was confused and I would thought, I would think like, man, what, what's going on with me? I'm normally not antisocial, but now I just realize we all have those places of either in strength or in weakness that we tend to go to. And I think it's so valuable for helping you to understand not just your teams, but then the people that you're ministering to. And it helps me be a lot less frustrated when people don't have like the get up and go that I do. Yeah. Well, for listeners who don't know much about the Enneagram, you might be confused right about now. You should go Google it. There are a million resources. The Road Back to You, I think, is probably the most popular book about it. But for people who don't know what an eight is, do you want to describe it real quick? Yeah, eights tend to be your uh, leadership type personalities or the kids, the little girls that are called bossy growing up, um, <laughs> you know, they're, uh, kind of your go-getters, your world changers. Um, what I have found with me, I am a good motivator for, you know, when somebody else looks at a challenge and they're like, Oh, I, you know, I need to research it or whatever. I'm like, let's just do it and figure it out as we go. And if we have problems, we'll just fix them. And that is intimidating to my husband who is, um, much more of a planner and, you know, like some of my staff or other, other people on our teams they they don't even understand what I'm talking about, but I'm like, let's just go, let's just figure it out. And so eights, I think have a tendency to be just your, your, um, aggressive types. And so in health, that can be amazing because those are the ones that you know, tend to get stuff, a lot of stuff done and start new ministries and do all the things. But in unhealth, that can look really dangerous because um, it can, it can be, sometimes it can even be abusive towards the people that are around you um, because other people just don't always have the energy to keep up with that mentality. And so in mm-hmm. unhealth, it can look really like aggressiveness and, um, you know, just a lack of patience and, you know, just really just this general sense of feeling like like others aren't measuring up. And I myself have had to really guard against that. It, it's been really helpful to learn that about myself because I do have a tendency for that. Like one of my daughters is just, she's just a, a sweet little introvert. And I'm like, let's go, let's go, you know, let's go. We're going to go to an amusement park this weekend. And she's kind of like recoiling a little bit. And she's like, mom, I don't know if I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, and, <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to do it? It's a roller coaster. It's fine. And, and I guess just realizing that even with my kids, that we all have different temperaments and personalities, it's been really helpful to help me learn how to parent them better and how to be a better leader and how to be a better team member when we kind of recognize that we're, we're all across the board, across the board, because God has made us unique and, and and distinct from one another. Yeah, yeah. I think the body of Christ is all of them, right? Yeah, that sure. that's the beauty of it is that He made us all different, and I think Jesus Himself was all like a mix, right? Because He's all all the best of yeah. all of it. Yeah. Um, I'm a two, and that they call us the helper. I don't really like that. I don't really like being the helper. I like the befriender or the connect because I think that's where my strengths lie is like finding people, the wallflowers, bringing them in, inviting people in, you know? Um, But we do tend to help a lot because we really like to be liked. We really like to be in the mix all the time. And so most of the time when I'm healthy, I'm an extrovert, I think. And then now being a parent with four boys where there's lots of noise and I'm needed 24 (laughs) seven, I love alone time. I really love alone time nowadays and quiet is one of my favorites. But um, it's interesting. You said the Martha thing about her being an eight, because after I just said, when I get stressed, I go into Martha. Um, Twos go to eight and stress. So very often I grew up with one sister. Our house was very calm. It was very compliant. Both of us are pretty, we're pretty good kids, so to speak. So I was not even prepared for what four boys was going to be like. I had no idea, like the testosterone (laughs) and the challenge, the noise, it is something. And I'm parent sometimes like a military mom. And I like really go into eight because I feel like I sort of have to step up, you know, (laughs) to do that. That may be, that may be why I feel like Martha so often. That's very interesting that you put that together. That's really funny. Yeah, that she's might not be, here. We can't really. Yeah, we can't that, really. Put that, might her on the good, Enneagram, uh, that might be a good study to try to typify characters in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. 
Well, Rachel, is there anything you wanted to talk about today that we didn't get to? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I know we don't have a lot of time to unpack this, but, um, one of the things that I think is a lot of overlap with both of us is the area of soul care. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts on that. Um, especially for women that are in leadership, um, we tend to put our needs last and I think that lends itself to that stressed feeling, um, you know, that Martha, that frenzied Martha feeling, I feel like. Um, and so I guess maybe just if you want to speak to that a little bit, if you have um, some uh, tips or guidance for, yeah. um, you know, people that are just feeling that right now and beyond uh, centering themselves and, of course, you know, spending some time in worship and in the word, um, that sometimes is just not enough, um, because we are body, soul, and spirit. And so from our body's perspective, um, soul care is, is more than just rest. Um, and I think sometimes we don't hear enough about that. So I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Oh, thanks, Rachel. I always ask my guests about their own soul care, and somehow I forgot today. I must be off my game starting this new season, so thank you for bringing it up. That's so great. Um, Yeah, so the way that I think about the soul is I take it from Dallas Willard, and he talks about four layers of of ourselves, and um, that includes our relationships, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits. And all, I think about all of those things when I think about soul care, because if any one of those four things are off, we don't feel like ourselves. Like if I have a headache that affects my body, but you better believe it's going to affect my relationships because I'm not going to be a hundred percent present, you know? And so I think taking care of all those things, the best that we can is, is a part of soul care. Um, what does that look like? I think that can look different for each person. So there's no prescription for what that needs to look like, but I think obviously when we talk about spiritual things, the things you already talked about, spending time with the Lord in prayer, I think often those are things that make people feel guilty, like they should be a to-do list. And I find when I ask people about self-care or soul care, Christian women especially tend to feel guilty right away. Like, oh, I'm not doing a good job of that. I don't, I don't, I probably should be doing better. I don't really know. And I think people think that must be like manicures or going to the gym. And it could be, but I don't think it has to be. The way that I think about it is, what are the things that bring you renewal? Like binge watching Netflix, that gives you a break. But do you come away from it feeling renewed? Do you come away from it feeling refreshed? When I think about soul care, those are the things I'm thinking about. So that could be different on different days. Maybe it means I need to take a walk. Like I need to get out of the four walls of my house and I need to get out in nature. I have a dear friend, coworker who, um, that is a major part of her soul care. Like she can tell if she hasn't been out in nature and she hasn't gone on any hikes in a long time because she can feel it almost in her body. So that's a major part of hers. Um, for me, probably music is, is maybe a part of it. Um, I love to learn. So listening to podcasts or reading books, those are part of mine. Now I can get too involved in that and not want to do the things I need to do, but, <laughs> but a good amount of those are really healthy for my mind, I think, because I, I love to learn kind of like you. It sounds like you do too and get in and study things. Um, a big part for me that I noticed in the pandemic and probably for everybody to an extent is having good conversations with people, like feeling connected in relationship. And during the p- pandemic, I didn't get as much of that. And it really, really affected me. I mean, I think I knew that I needed people, but like I knew that I needed people and uh, Zoom wasn't quite doing it, you know, like I needed the whole body language. I needed an actual body in the room with me that I could talk to that weren't my own family members, you know, like good friends that get it. So having a good coffee date and um, being able to talk deeply in conversation about things that matter, that's, that's a part of mine. But I think for each person, it may look a little different depending on what your personality is, depending even on what season of life you're in, because the things that I need right now as a 38 year old are different than what I needed as a 24 year old. Um, and probably when I'm 55, some of it'll be the same and some of it'll be different. What about for you, Rachel? What are the things that really bring you renewal and refreshment? Um, well, I think it lo- has looked different in different seasons. Um 
you know, traveling missions has been just part of the DNA of who I am. And so because we haven't been able to travel for the better part of two years now, um, that has been really difficult, um, because that is something that just fuels me. I mean, one trip in country will fuel me for the whole year. Um, just because it, it, it's one of the places that I really feel truly used by the Lord in all of the gifts that he's given me. Mm -hmm. And, And so that has looked different. Um, in this season, the way that I have kind of transitioned that is by writing the book and, um, not just writing the book, but then by engaging with people like you and, um, with some of my listeners and helping people learn, about their relationship with the Lord. Um, I think I'm really people driven. Like my husband is an introvert. So for him, like after he's been around people, he needs quiet and and downtime. I'm the opposite. I need, I need my people. And so, you know, like you said, the, the pandemic had been really difficult. Now we, you know, thankfully my girls are pretty social and talkers and all of that. And so, um, it did help that we had the kids here, but like you said, at a certain point you want people besides your family, um, to engage with. So I think for me really, um, in that season, it meant a lot of reading for me. It was zoom calls, um, because I felt like I was going through what I have called the season of hiddenness, where it just reminded me a lot of the prophet Elijah and how there's different times in his life that God hid him away to strengthen Uh him, you know, really to strengthen him for further ministry. And because I had been in such public out there, you know, high fast paced ministry for the last decade, I needed that season to just rest and re-engage and listen for the the direction of the Holy Spirit. And through that season, I'm I'm back in uh seminary at Talbot from Biola and we engaged with a lot of our professors because it was such a season, a heavy season. They were really intentional about making sure that we didn't kind of fall off. And so for me, it did look like a lot of Zoom calls and um, WhatsApp. And I remember having a moment with people from all over the world. It was one of our Zoom calls with seminary. And, um, you know, there's people from, you know, Korea and uh, Singapore and California and Australia and Florida and Pennsylvania. And our professor led us through just some worship together. And I never would have thought it was possible, but, um, the presence of the Holy Spirit filled my bedroom through the worship that we were doing through zoom. And, you know, it was such a moment of clarity where the Lord just kind of showed me like he is not bound by the things that we think he's bound by and he can still work through those things. So is it more difficult? Yes, for sure. And I also think, um, really listening to him in regards to, agendas because I tend to have my own agendas and (laughs) and I and I think when I take the time to really focus and listen to the Lord for his agenda um that fuels me in a different way because it's so much better and of course there's other things like I've been painting lately and um we got back big into the arts during um during the pandemic so there's things like that that I do too but um really just being, being engaged with the Holy Spirit and knowing that he is directing things, whether that is, um, what I'm writing or, you know, the podcasting or, um, planning for future mission trips, whatever that is. Um, that's really kind of the place that I get filled back up. And, um, that's been different in different seasons, but I think probably because we've been so isolated, that's really where my heart's been, um, focused on. Yeah. Oh, I did think of one more for me too, gardening, which I don't do in the winter. And this year has been kind of a dud, honestly, because we had a late frost. But there's something about getting in the dirt and watching what I've planted come to life and being able to prepare the food. And there's something really life-giving about that for me. So every year I usually have a big garden. About July, I'm like, meh, the weeds took over. I think I'm over it. We're getting ready for school again. But there's something about springtime and everything coming to life. So over the summer, a lot of my feed on my pause renew next step while I haven't had my podcast has been my garden because that is part of my soul care. So I figure I might as well share it. Nobody's yeah. coming to my house to see it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, some people are, but you know, not my friends on Instagram. So yeah, yeah, I love that too. And I think about that too, how, um, something 
you know, it needs to be buried and disappear for a while while God kind of just does what he does. And then it, mm-hmm. then it grows. And one of the things that I had said during the pandemic was, um, I think it's bamboo. Bamboo, for the first five years when you plant it, um, it's it's dormant. It doesn't do anything. You don't think anything's happening. And then the sixth year, it shoots up 90 feet. And I was thinking about that in terms of this, like, hidden season that a lot of us are in. Um we can feel like nothing's going on, but maybe it's that season of preparation because he's preparing us for exponential growth in the next season. And so um, I just think there's so much value in that. Ooh, Rachel, that's a good word. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad you shared that. <laughs> that is a good word. Yeah, I've heard, I don't know, but I've heard bamboo grows so fast you can hear it growing. Really? I don't know. That's that's exponential growth right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so glad that we got to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And um, I'm just looking forward to um, any way that the Lord might have us interact again in the future. Yeah, Rachel, real quick, before we end, can you share where people can find all your stuff? Yeah, uh, my website's shehears.org. I'm pretty much she hears on everywhere. So Facebook is okay. she hears, Instagram is she hears. Um, my book is available on my website, but also, uh, Amazon or pretty much anywhere books are sold. Okay. And for me, same thing. You can find me anywhere at pause, renew, next three words put together. So on Instagram, I'm at pause, renew, next. You can look for me on Facebook as well. And then the website is pause, renew, next.com, which I hope sometime this fall, to redo my website and have it look better. But that didn't get done this summer and it's okay. That was part of my soul care too. I had to put that off. There were more important things. So yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I, I hope that your listeners will come and interact with me a little bit too. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.